Hello and welcome to another episode of The Power of Story and Science. I'm your host, David Oti, and as you're aware, perhaps, I uh, hope you're aware, on this program, we really look at the intersection of technical presentations and storytelling. How do you tell the story of your work, whether that's in a presentation or in a conversation? And as you may also be aware, this program is a mix of conversations and content. And today's episode is going to be a conversation. I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Susan Roan, who is the author of the best-selling book, How to Work a Room. She's going to share some tips with us today on that thing that we introverts, and yes, I identify as one, uh, shudder at the thought of doing. That's not syntactically great, but it'll have to do. And that is networking. How do we meet other people? How do we form in a short time those beneficial relationships? Especially as we're maybe be rusty at that because some of us, so many of us have been limited to Zoom for our interactions for the last year and a half. So, Susan, I'm so glad to have you on the show here today. Well, I'm delighted to be here and I'm grateful to Zoom or I wouldn't be able to be here. So <laughs> I'm one of the proponents. Well, I am too, because if it weren't for Zoom, I would be primarily unemployed or would have been for the last <laughs> year and a half. <laughs> oh, with uh, most of us, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I do so much of my uh, my training and speaking from right here in this space in my home, which I'm fortunate to have available to me. I call it my Zudio. <laughs> I'm oh, sitting here it. wearing my Zoomiform. <laughs> <laughs> but and I know, am going to be. I'm, I'm going to tell the audience that Dave and I were trying to set a time, and I said, "Oh, I need to put on more makeup." So you know, Zoom requires that we get ready for the as this as if we were in person so that's just right. to let all of you know that i'm well made up <laughs> we have to be ready for our close-up even for those who are just listening to the to the audio version of this program they'll appreciate that i'm sure i was mentioning to you a minute ago i just got back from my first live conference in a year well actually that particular conference was last held live two years ago and i spoke then and since then, for this same organization, I have presented several times virtually. And it was so good to be back in a room with people. Even though attendance at this, what's typically a very large conference, was at best, between the people who were there live and the people who joined it online, it was at best half of their usual attendance. And I had about half or less of the usual attendance at my sessions. But do you know what? Because I was there in the room with people, some wonderful conversations took place that other good things will come from. And so that's what I'm hoping that my particular audience, people, and, and I'm focused primarily on people who give technical presentations, but you know what? If you go to a conference or a meeting, you've still got to form relationships with people. Otherwise, how are you gonna find collaborators? How are you gonna find funding? all those things that you need. So there's got to be more to it than just getting up on a stage and presenting. And Susan, I'd like you to take it from there and tell us, first of all, how did you get to be the recognized expert on working the room? And, and what does working the room mean anyway? Well, it started with the fact that I grew up in Chicago and the phrase how to work a room was part of the lexicon. Oh, also was part of the lexicon of uh, we got cement shoes for you in a lake if you don't watch your step. <laughs> so I, I knew that from politics, but I wrote about this and I changed the term from networking. And I want to say this to the audience. If you're walking around saying, I hate networking, stop it. Because <laughs> just stop networking, it. just stop it. And I'll tell you what. Knowing how to work a room, because I wrote two separate books with no repetition, and My Secrets of Savvy Networking are two separate books, but they're also two separate skills. But for those of you that have to present about technical and want to wind in your stories, together they are so powerful. If we look at working a room as really meeting, connecting, socializing, having a good time, and networking as 
the follow-up. What do you do with the cards? In fact, I started the Secrets of Savvy Networking. I'm surprised it wasn't edited out saying, if the cards in your pocket go to the cleaners, you're a one night stand. So <laughs> they left that in. But really it's meeting people is so important because it's what you said. It's all about relationships. I don't care what business, what company, what profession, it's relationships that make the world go round, the business world, the funding world, et cetera. So you have to meet people. I, I just sent a tweet today that said, if you only talk to the people you already know, you'll only learn what you already know. You don't expand your thinking. You don't expand your knowledge base. You don't expand your world if you only stick with the tried and true. And it's daunting. And that's what I, I've spoken to a number of technical conferences and engineering companies, et cetera, including Intel, which was kind of interesting for a definitely technical audience. The thought of walking into a room full of people we don't know is daunting. And that doesn't matter if you're the CEO, the CFO, the IT person, the trainer. And I wrote that book because people said to me, oh, you know, I, I really don't like going to these events. And it started with a woman who took my career change three night seminar, which I designed for teachers. And then we expanded it. And she was so loquacious. And then I said, well, if you really are interested in other careers, go to the association of whatever. And instead of meeting one person at an informational interview, you could talk to 10 people in the cocktail hour. And this woman said, oh, I couldn't do that. Really? Why? Oh, I couldn't talk to people. And I'm thinking to myself, and I didn't say it, really? You haven't shut up for three nights. What makes you? <laughs> but the idea, and I had to turn off my own brain and say, well, listen to what she's saying. Walking into a room full of people you don't know is uncomfortable. That's so right. So I want to say this. For anyone that thinks that, you're not, you're not alone. According to the research, almost 90% of us self-identify as shy. Really? I did not know that. Yes, Dr. Philip Zimbardo at the stand, he very famous for his prison uh, uh, project in the 70s, but he was a founder of the Stanford Shyness Clinic and he studied shyness. And in the 1980, he found 80% of us self-identified as shy. By 1988, it was up to like 91, 92%. And when they asked him, what would you attribute? That's a huge jump in people that don't feel comfortable around people. He said one word, technology. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, because the things that we think like Zoom or, or social media that we think are connecting us are really in so many ways isolating us one from another at that very personal human interaction level, aren't they? Well, he this is his research that was even before we had texting. Right. He was so it was something that has even been exacerbated in the last five years by even further technology. That makes uh, sense. You know, it's so funny, if I've talked to a young person, they think they're so well connected, and I know these many people, and this and that. In the meantime, they can't get it together. I see it with my own, you know, great nieces and nephews. They can't get it together to show up at the same place because they're so busy connecting on the phone. They never meet anyone. <laughs> I, and I've heard other parents tell me that. One mother told me her son's idea of a Saturday night was trying to figure out where to meet people. By that time, he was tired. He never went out. By that time, he was too tired to go out. <laughs> you know, my youngest daughter is, um, if you look at our family, the mix of introverts and, and extroverts, the introverts uh, definitely outnumber the extroverts. 
And my my youngest daughter would probably describe herself to you as being uh, one of the most introverted members of our family. She has a, a small circle of close friends, and yet I'm really proud of her for this. She does manage to get together and, and go out with them for uh, game nights and things like this. But I know what an effort it's taken for her. She hasn't always felt that comfortable doing that and making new friends. And you know, kudos to her and kudos to both of you for raising her so that she does make the effort. And I don't even say about, we know people our age who don't make the effort. Mm. They don't. And I, this, I'm gonna say something that is so old fashioned, all of you are gonna go, what generation is she? We don't pick up the phone anymore to even call people to say, how are you? Well, I have one friend that had knee surgery, another friend back surgery. You gotta pick up the phone and hear, hear how they are, especially when we're not in person. The people who will stand out in the crowd, and this is something I will say to all of us that are showing up in person, the number one trait of the people who succeed in whatever they do is follow up. Follow up. Okay, that bears repeating. So that's, does that go back to what you said before that working a room is what happens at the event and networking is what happens after? Right. And you know, I learned from, listen, the book's been out for 33 years. I've been speaking on this on stages and hanging out with clients. And I had people in very important positions tell me things like, what you said, I just want to have a conversation. If we have a conversation, we're connected. I don't bother to sell them anything. I don't bother to pitch them anything. Because through the conversation, things evolve and segue and they grow. But when you build that connection and you find the common bond, it's easier to move the conversation around. Um, I, so these, two, in fact, these two guys were, um, they were the people who ran the Superdome and where they were trying to book a lot of events. They told me they would even go out to lunch twice with people, never ask for the business. Mm but have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was important. So if we're in rooms, the, the number one thing I like to stress so that you won't stress. Oh, I just made that up. That's good. <laughs> I have to pre prepare, prepare, prepare. And it just was given a, a visual to me because I just had my um, flooring replaced. But I watched how much time the team worked on preparing so that the actual work was not as difficult. So I would stress for preparation, have your own planned self-introduction, because unlike David, you're not going to have someone introducing you as you walk in the door of some room, though you <laughs> might like that. And the Susan Rowan self-introduction is very different than most. It's not a 15 to 30 second elevator speech. No, Probably. because you don't have you don't have permission for that yet. Yeah, you shouldn't even give it in an elevator. No one took <laughs> the elevator to get in to listen to you talk about yourself for 30 seconds. Um, it's a pleasantry and a pleasantry seven to nine seconds. Okay. And the three traits, seven to nine seconds, link it to the event you're at whether you're the speaker, a funder, a vendor, uh, an interested party, why are you at the event? Why you do that is it gives the other person context for why you're there. It will help them make conversation with you. And then the third trait I learned from our mutual friend, Patricia Fripp, which is, and she said this to me, Roanne, tell them, do not give your title because titles mean different things in different companies. And she said, and I have said this and written this for 40 years, give the benefit of what you do. The benefit, right. Yes. So I don't say that I'm a mega best-selling author and speaker. All of that's true, but I don't say it. 
What I say is that I turn people into mingling mavens. Mingling now, mavens. <laughs> and until Malcolm Gladwell wrote his book, Tipping Point, nobody knew what a maven was. But now people do. But they people you give people something that they can ask the next question or make the next comment. And when asked, oh, what does that mean? What exactly do you do? Then you're invited to say a little bit about what you do. And then I'm going to give you the magic. David, this turns it into a bonded, connected conversation. You give a little bit about yourself and then you stop. And you say these magic words. And what about you? And what about you? Oh, I because like that. It's so they, open-ended. It's open-ended. So here's what someone told me. They said, I really hate my job, but I love what I do as a volunteer. And what she did is she never even told me what she did for a living. She talked about her work with suicide prevention. Oh. Do you okay. give people permission to talk about that which they're enthused and they love and if someone's between jobs, they're not put on the spot. Right, right. If they're not, if they're, if they don't have a, a job title right now. I mean, if their title is looking, <laughs> you yeah. don't want to put them on the spot, right? I like that. Yeah. So, um, the way you prepare, you said prepare, prepare, prepare for an opportunity. Uh, when you're going to be in a room with strangers. And the way you prepare is you have that seven to nine second. Um, Self-introduction. Self-introduction ready to go. Yeah. And, and you key it to the event and you give the benefit of what you do. Another thing to prepare, and this isn't as tacky as it sounds, is prepare conversation. And mm. what I mean by that is my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Kurtz said, if you want to be a good conversationalist, you must be well informed. To be well informed, you must be well read. And that means the newspaper. Well, now we can get um, curated news. We can even get news on our watch, though I would never be able to read anything from my watch. <laughs> I can barely tell time. And by the way, for those of you not wearing a watch, this is what it looks like. Um, so people have phones now. But you can get your news. You need to know what's going on in your profession, in your community, right. in your city. And this is a global economy. You need to know what's going on globally. That doesn't mean that you have to read newspapers from 20 different cities, but have an idea. I had a client who was with a, a very important law firm in Pittsburgh. And he told me, he was a partner, and he read four newspapers a day. He read the Pittsburgh Gazette, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. And I said, USA Today? He said, oh yeah, I have to know what's going on in sports everywhere because my clients are everywhere. And he said, and the weather everywhere. And I thought to myself, what a smart man. Mm, That's how mm. he made partner. He could make conversation with clients anywhere. That's right. He could, couldn't he? Wow, that's yeah. that's really insightful. I thought so too. So you prepare conversation, you prepare your self-introduction. And I know this is gonna sound a little um, I don't know what, woo-woo, but you prepare your attitude. You know, if you walk into a room and I loved her dilly dearly, but like the Aunt Tillies of the world, oh, I'm going to have a miserable time. What am I doing here? I could be home. I could be watching Netflix. I could be baking sourdough bread. You know, I'm one of the people that never during the pandemic tried to bake sourdough because I live in San Francisco area. I don't have to learn. It's all <laughs> over here. That's right. <laughs> but there's so many things you could do. But if you go into a room with the attitude of, well, I don't like small talk and I don't, I don't like to network and I, you will convey it. People will pick that up from you. So I want everyone to do this. I want you to switch from what am I doing here and what am I going to say to what one of my clients 
told me she and her husband did. They switched to, oh, I wonder who I'm going to get to meet. I wonder who I'm going to get to meet. Now that's a shift in perspective, isn't it? She told me that changed their whole business. They used to hate going to business mixers and events. And one time they went and they met someone, they had such a roaring good laughing time who never became a client, but became a friend that they decided to consciously out loud say this like a mantra and put a smile on their face when they said it and in their tone. Oh, I wonder who I'm going to get to meet. That, that will shift your insides. That will shift the look on your face. And people pick that up. Now, I know there are some events, and I live in, you know, Northern California, where a lot of us wear masks. I do all the time. It covers some wrinkles. But <laughs> it also, when you're smiling, your eyes smile. And people can see that even with a mask. Um, and there will be times we won't be masked when we'll all be, you know, vaccinated and safe and this thing will be gone. But if your tone of voice and your eyes convey that you're interested in meeting people, and that will make you approachable. Approachable. Yeah, I, we haven't really talked about that. How do you... How do you uh, send off the vibe that someone can come up and talk to you? Well, I have people in my sessions, I don't care if it's a thousand people or a hundred people, do an exercise where they get to meet people and then we always debrief. And what people always say, and I've written it, the number one attribute that makes it okay to come over to us, eye contact. Eye contact, don't, okay. Don't kick lint off your pants, your head's down. The eyes, especially now, depending on how you manage this pandemic, et cetera, your eyes will be the windows to your soul. I didn't make that up. I know that's a long, <laughs> long But eye contact, if you look at someone, you're actually extending a visual invitation. The other thing they said that makes it easy to go over to someone is a smile. So remember that for when you are in situations that your smile is visible. I've had people say, my face doesn't smile. I had a woman come up to me after a program I did in New Orleans and literally had tears in her eyes. She said, my face doesn't smile. She said, when my son was seven, I picked him up at school and he said, mommy, why are you angry at me? And she said, I wasn't angry. But her face had that look. She said she's had to work really hard to make sure that her muscles are in a smile status. So that's just the reminder. Some of you are probably listening going, well, that's not technical. Well, you got that right. It is not. This is relational. It's personal. And it's something you would want your own children to do. You'd want them to be people who were approachable, people who extended themselves, people who had social skills. Their lives are easier. Mm, lives are easier when you have social skills. And, you know, I think that uh, you, you can also make the argument that based on what's been said and written recently, in recent years about emotional intelligence, that people will be more successful as, as well, professionally. Not just will their lives be easier, but their lives are likely to lead them into more, uh, I think, fruitful directions when they can connect with people and use their emotional intelligence, which includes the skill of putting other people at ease. And, you know, I've never really thought of myself as someone whose face naturally drifts into a smile. <laughs> it's just, but the last, it is. The last year and a half... You know what's changed? Looking at myself in Zoom all the time. <laughs> I don't want to appear drab. I don't want to appear uninterested. And you just said the magic word, which I will repeat for our audience. There are two parts to working a room. One is to be interesting. And don't we all want to be interesting? What is even more significant for the people in that room 
is that we are interested. Interested. Yeah, and you just said it. It's and yes, and by the way, a year of looking at myself. Oh, by the way, and in that year, I've turned white. I have the Corona coiffure. <laughs> Wouldn't go on. So I watched myself turn totally white haired. But you know, it's it helps monitor. It, it, I even shared this with people when before we had Zoom and we were making phone calls for business and calling clients. I always made phone calls standing up and I always looked in a mirror. And the reason Wait, let me is I, that you always made your phone calls standing up and looking in a mirror. Yes. Okay. And I'll tell you why. I also wore a headset and because I talk with my hands and I wanted to make sure I was smiling. I wanted to make sure that if they didn't get some of my great lines, at least I didn't thought that I was funny. But <laughs> I, I knew that being me meant that I talked with my hands and that I, when I spoke, if I was saying something I thought was warm or fun, then I smiled. So I always did that, but now Zoom is our mirror. It is, it is, and it's a very unforgiving one sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> it's uh, it's right there in, in front of you when you're, well, in my case, when I'm presenting training or, or even um, uh, a, a speech, a keynote, something like that, of course, with those, I, I'm not likely to be able to see my audience anyway. But if I'm doing a training and it's a meeting setting and I can see other people's webcams and see my own, there's always this uh, comparison going on. Do I look happy to be here? And that person doesn't look happy to be here. What's wrong with them? And, you know, those, those thoughts are going through your head while you're talking into this mirror that we call Zoom or if it's Teams or anything else. And we don't want to be picking on one company, but those are the ones that most of the people I know have been using. Um, I am grateful for Zoom because I, I am the instigator. The instigator decided as long as we were all sheltered in place, and by the way, the San Francisco, six of the counties, we went shelter in place before California did. So we've been sheltering in place for a long time. I go, well, I'm not doing this alone. And our friend Patricia Fripp said, Susan, you're hosting your cousins at a brunch on Zoom. They do not want to be cut off after 40 minutes pop for the professionals so that they could talk <laughs> as long as you want. And I went, oh yeah. And so I did, I put together a cousin's brunch. My grammar school girlfriends, we meet monthly. My high school friends meet every other month. And because of me, a certain group of us who are speakers meet monthly. And through all of this have been very supportive. And um, though it wasn't my idea initially, I also host a weekly of my friends who are my sorority sisters, one group of them. And I say that to you as you don't have to be alone. And I'm going to give you something that Sir Richard Branson quoted me on. Um, and my cousin Shelley thought it was brilliant. So two very important. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> One of the roadblocks to working a room is that we act like a guest in a room that we walk into. Dr. Adele Sheely wrote in the original Success Magazine, don't act like a guest, act like a host. Act like a host. Yes. Okay. And you'll notice what I just did in the terms of storytelling. I have been quoting her since for four decades. Even though I could say, well, I said it because it's four decades, I always give credit where credit is due. That was what I learned from her. And she said, act like the host. And that serves us well in any room. But there's another roadblock. The remedy to that roadblock is instead of good things come to those who wait. And some of you might want to write this down, type it into your note. The Susan Rowan version, good things come to those who initiate. 
And that's what Sir Richard Branson quoted me on. Good things come to those who initiate. I was number six on this list. I think Diana Ross was number five. And I've been telling everyone, I'm a backup speaker for Diana Ross. <laughs> Stop in the name of networking. Um, because if we initiate, if we say to someone, oh, how are you doing? Which, by the way, I've been reading some things about people going, oh, it's such a trite question. No, it is not. Oh, I agree. We have endured 19 months of an unbelievable situation. How are you doing is an important question to ask. And then I'm going to give you the magic. Listen to the answer listen to the answer i figured that's where you're going with that yes ask and then make sure you're really interested in what they have to say in response you know i've had people and you know i've spoken to partners at law firms and consulting firms well you know uh, how do, when can i change to my agenda and you know we're, we're having a cocktail party and i'm looking at them going well like don't Here's what happens. Conversations are organic. If you're listening to a person, and I do an exercise with them to prove it, you start here and it moves there. But if you try to manipulate a conversation to your agenda, trust me, the other person will know and they'll always feel manipulated. That's right. Susan, how are you doing? I am doing, now that you gave me time to put on extra makeup, I'm doing spectacularly well. <laughs> well, you know what, it's, it's very interesting. I live in um, the San Francisco area and we've just had this bomb cyclone of rain. It's been unbelievable. But I think to myself, you know what? If this too shall pass. I, get, I don't know if that's, we've been through so much the last 19 months, but uh, all I could say is, I didn't have use of my kitchen sink. And I've now been telling people I couldn't make dinner last night. I've been camping in my own home. I couldn't make coffee. So I think what's what you and I said, if you wait long enough after something happens that's untoward and you can start smiling, there will be a great line for a great story. That's right. And Speakers never have bad days. We just get more material. That's what I've always said to people, not that I think I'm like Madonna, the original or the singer, but I consider myself the original material girl. And by the way, when someone does something, because I'm from Chicago and I just gave a talk called Don't Make Me Go Chicago on You, um, <laughs> be very, very careful. Uh, I always think this, if somebody does something, that I'm like, what were you thinking? I think, and it's kind of great revenge, and I hope people won't judge me for this, oh, but you will, but I stand my ground. And that is, okay, you pulled that nonsense. Give me a week, and it's material, and you'll be hearing it and reading it. And it's and material. I will, and that it's makes you the material girl. <laughs> and that makes me the material girl. And I might change the name to protect the guilty. In fact, every one of my books has a disclaimer. Thank you for those who have been the transgressors of good taste. You have given me material. I've changed the names to protect you. But the truth is everything eventually is a story. And I would like all of your audience to look at things that happen as there is a story in that. There's some great quote about the uh, the sculptor. Here's a piece of marble, but in it is a wonderful piece. You just have to whittle it and shape it. So, uh, yes, Michelangelo, I think, was quoted as saying, "I just uh, there was an angel in there, and I let him out." And that's I forgot that that was mm -hmm. Michelangelo. So there you go. And here's what's nice about when you forget a specific name and quote. That's why we need to have friends that can fill in the <laughs> Fill in. <laughs> oh, this has been such a delightful conversation. Is, is there one short tip that you would leave my audience that will help them in their next live event when they actually get to walk into a room with strangers? 
number one top tip is go everywhere to have a good time. If you do, you will, and others will flock to you because nobody goes over to the sourpuss and says, oh, there's an unhappy person I want to meet. <laughs> there's the unhappy person I want to meet. I, I think you've got to be 100% correct there. Who would want to do that? <laughs> Not Susan, I. this has been just delightful. Um, my guest on The Power of Story and Science has been the ever effervescent Susan Roan. <laughs> Uh, who, after a, a trying day of dealing with a storm's aftermath, uh, was willing and able to put herself together and be here on the show with me. And Susan, uh, how would my audience members follow up with you? What's the most important thing they should know about you or your products or services or how to get in touch with you? Okay, I am a speaker. I'm also an author. Um, you can... Susan Rowan website, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E. If you have a burning question that you want answered, I'm a former teacher. We don't let you suffer when you get end of ulcers because you have a burning question. Email me, Susan at SusanRowan.com. But if you have a real burning question, 415-461-3900. I learned that from the teacher. I was a teacher. The teacher next door to me said, don't make your parents crazy about the new math. Call me and I will help you. So I give my number out. If you have a question, I got an answer. And I'm guessing you'd rather people just pick up the phone and call you rather than text you at that number. Oh, no. Actually, that number is a, a landline. It's my office number. I know there are a lot of people going, a landline? Who could... Let me tell you about landline, folks. When you don't have power, you're the only person who has a phone that works within a mile radius. <laughs> That's right. So people may pick up the phone and dial the number and speak into that little thing they hold in their hand, and you'll hear them. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> it's, it's a, it's, and by the way, your grandparents, your parents, your bet, people want to hear your voice. They really don't want to read your text. Want to hear your voice. What a great thought to leave us with because this program is all about being heard. The power of story and science. And my, my voice and the voices of my guests on this program are being heard far and wide. I have been contacted by at least one listener in South Africa. So I know you're out there and you are welcome to contact me as well. For those of you who are part of the story and science community, you can go to my website, davidot.com, and find one of the buttons that says schedule consultation and get on my calendar. If you'd like to learn more about this program, its homepage can be found at storyandscience.com. Susan, thank you for being on the show with me today. Thank you so much. It's been fun. It has been fun. And good luck with uh, whatever recovery is, is necessary as you, as you recover from that storm, which I believe is headed our way in Denver next. <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> so to all of our listeners and viewers, thank you for being part of the story and science community.